Good morning, sir. Morning. Um, our, fir our first witness this morning is Mr. Chirag Sidpura. I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. <coughs> declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall <coughs> give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Good morning. My name is Katrina Hodge, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Please state your full name. Uh, Mr. Chirag Sidpura. Um, you made a statement, Mr. Sibura, on the 11th of March of this year, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Um, do you have a copy of your witness statement in front of you? I do, yes. Could I ask you please to turn um, to the final page, at page 20? Yep. Um, do you see your signature in the middle of that page? I do, yes. Um, have you had a chance to read that statement again since it was made on the 11th? I did, yes. Um, is the content true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, it is. Um, there are three um, exhibits to your statement, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Um, the uh, first of these is a spreadsheet, is that correct? Yes, there is, yes. Which you produced yourself? I did, yes. Um, the second is um, a copy of your case file, is that right? That's correct, yes. Um, how did you come to obtain that? Under the subject access request uh, from the post office. Thank you. Um, and the third, I believe, is a copy of your letter of termination from the post office. Is that That's right? That's right, yeah. Thank you. Um, they'll all be adduced in due course with your statement. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by asking you a few questions um, about your background, if okay. I may. And before you joined the post office, you worked as a computer engineer, is that right? That's right, yes. And what did that work involve? Uh, it was taking care of uh, approximately 30 sites throughout the country, um, maintaining... Um, and servicing an IT infrastructure uh, on, on the offices um, and the main head office as well. Um, how long did you work in that role? Uh, approximately just under two years. Um, when did you first begin working in a post office branch? I can't remember the, the year, um, but it was actually at my father-in-law's post office in Rygate. What was your role in the post office? Uh, it was just assisting and being clerk. And were you involved in that role in balancing the accounts, for example? No, not really, no. Um, how long did you work in your father-in-law's branch? Uh, about a year and a half to two years. Um, whilst working there, you applied to be the sub-postmaster of the post office in Farncombe, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Um, why did you decide to do that? Uh, I went to a business of my own. Um, I wanted some stability uh, with, a, with a decent income. Um, but I didn't want a post office which was already made, um, or a shop that was already made. Uh, I wanted something which I could develop. Uh, I came across the one in, in Farncombe, which was very outdated um, and had a lot of potential. When were you appointed as the sub-postmaster of Farncombe? Uh, I took over the branch on the 21st of January 2013. How did you feel in taking on this new role? I felt great. Um, it, was, it was like a milestone in my life that I could uh, really make a difference to a, uh, a small community. How did you afford to purchase the Farncombe branch? My uh, mother-in-law and my father-in-law had uh, uh, lent me some money. Um, as well as, no, sorry, not lent me the money, they'd gifted the money to, to me and my wife. Uh, and also um, there was a bank loan as well. Um, what improvements did you make to the branch when you purchased it? Um, initially we just tidied up the branch, um, added new stock, new lines, um, just expanded on, on the range of products and goods that we had uh, sold in the branch. Uh, well, in the, on the retail side, um, which made a difference because a lot more customers were starting to come in as opposed to going to the other shops which were local to us as well. Did you employ staff to assist you in running the branch? Uh, there was inherited staff in the post office, uh, 
which there was three inherited staff. Uh, they were all part time uh, because I was going to be running the actual branch myself as well. What salary did you receive on your appointment as sub postmaster? Uh, up at that point, it was a rough approximately thirty five thousand a year. Um, can you please describe the circumstances in which um, an ATM was installed in the branch? Uh, there was an application um, that the previous postmaster had uh, had already put in. I, I inherited that application. Um, the ATM was then installed in August 2013. Why was the installation of the ATM important to your customers and local community? It's so directly across the road uh, from from the post office branch in the shop. Uh, there used to be a Lloyd's TSB bank, which closed down a couple of years before I got there, um, which had an ATM machine uh, being literally on the doorstep of, of Funkham train station. It was something which was heavily used. Uh, so it was something which was important to the community to, to have back. Um, how much money was dispensed from the ATM on average each week? Between fifty to £60,000 a week. Um, how did the business perform under your management in, in the early, early years? It, it was fantastic. It was really a very affluent business. Um, I'm still there, but it's, it's still an affluent business. I'm going to ask you um, just a few questions about the changes that were made to your branch as part of the network transformation programme. Yeah. Um, can you describe what changes were made, please? We had a two-counter fortress um, post office, uh, which was very outdated. It must have been approximately 45 years old, 45 to 50 years old. Uh, with a wooden frame. Um, we had then come out of that uh, fortress counters and uh, we had two open uh, counters. Uh, open counters being as open as this is, uh, with just a slight plastic screen in front. Uh, yeah. Um, what arrangements did you make to enable your customers to access the ATM whilst these changes were being made to the branch? Uh, the ATM was fully funded before the branch had closed. Um, it had a substantial amount of money inside to, to service it for two weeks uh, while, while the branch was closed um, because the there's a lot of el elderly people with a, a post office card account, poker they call it a poker card um, and the IATM was the only one in the area that you could use that card with unless they went to another branch to actually withdraw money from that account. What effect did the network transformation program have on your salary as a sub postmaster? Initially we lost, uh, immediately we lost £12,000 um, court core tier payment they called it um, so whether the branch was open or closed you'd get £12,000 a year so we lost that um, and we were working on a 100% commission on the sales um, What changes did you, did you make to your opening hours um, as a result of the, the network transformation programme? Initially we were open from uh, 9 till 5.30 Monday to Friday uh, and then 9 till 12.30 on a Saturday closed on a Sunday. I then changed those hours so we were open from 8am till 7pm Monday to Saturday and 8am till 1pm on a Sunday. I'm going to ask you now, if I may, some questions about the training that you received. Yeah. Um, when you were appointed as a sub-postmaster, so back in 2013, what training did you receive then? I only had um, a one-week one week or two week uh, on-site training, uh, just on the counters. On. Do you recall who conducted that training? Uh, Cindy Kennard. Um, she was an auditor stroke trainer for the post office. Um, that I took had... place in your branch, is that Sorry? Right? That took place in the branch. In the that... branch, yes. Um, and she was just going through the, the sell selling of the products. Um, on how to upsell rather than downsell. So instead of someone wanting six first-class stamps, try and push for 12 first-class stamps. 
what was your impression of the quality of the training that you received? At that point, on, on the counters, it was fine. Uh, what training did you receive uh, when the ATM was installed in your branch? There was a representative from the Bank of Ireland um, that had given me initial training on the ATM machine. I had my brother-in-law uh, overlook this with me as well, just in case if I missed anything. It was qu quite a lot of, quite a lot to remember. Uh, I was shown how to load the ATM machine, how to decash the ATM machine, uh, how to print out the reports required to input into the Horizon system, because the ATM machine worked completely independent to the Horizon system. Um, so there was two reports that you'd t uh, print out from the ATM machine to then just input one of the figures into Horizon of your 24 hour, last 24 hour um, dispense figure. So if I've understood you correctly, Horizon would keep a record of the amount of cash that was uploaded and should have been dispensed by the machine, is that right? Once you'd inputted it yourself? Um, y yes. Um, so uh, the only example I can give is, say for, so say for example, in the delivery from the cash office, you'd receive £50,000. On the following day, when you print the report and the report says you've dispensed ten thousand pounds, you'd go onto Horizon system into a different stock unit to then input that ten thousand pounds. Then go into you, uh, then go into declaring your cash, and reduce that figure by ten thousand pounds. With the aim that the figure on Horizon would match what was held Correct. in the ATM. Yeah. Um, how would you describe the adequacy of the training that you received? Um, I think you said that it was the, it was the Bank of Ireland representative who yep. initially trained you. Um, but how adequate was the training for you to understand what was required of you in terms of reconciling the figures on the ATM and as shown on Horizon? Oh, at first, I thought it was it was adequate enough. Um, uh, we were given a blue and white uh, ATM sheet. That would fill in uh, of how much money you'd load, how much money was dispensed, a total value, um, how much money was remaining. Uh, tally that up and put that into Horizon. Um, that was it. What issues did you experience after the ATM machine was installed? So on the first uh, first week of balancing. It was like ten thousand pounds surplus. Following week, it was like ten thousand um, pound shortfall. So the figures were. Uh, so I was doing something wrong. Um, then I contacted um, the post office helpline to to get someone out as quickly as possible to to sort this problem out because I didn't know what was going wrong. Um, so Cindy Kennard. Uh, was appointed and she came out to give me further assistance on the on the uh, balancing of the ATM machine. What advice did you receive from Cindy Kennard? Again, was just to follow the blue and white sheet um, and you won't go wrong. Before your branch was audited in October 2017, yeah. Um, did you experience any shortfalls and discrepancies on Horizon? There was always discrepancies, um, but only minor discrepancies um, of a couple of pounds or a few pounds up and down. Um, if it was if it was down, you'd put the money in just to balance it out at zero. If it was over, you'd take the money out and then balance at zero. Um. Your branch was um, first audited, I think, about four months after you took over, is, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Um, that audit took place before the ATM machine had been installed. That's right, that yeah. Right? Um, what happened at that audit? Um, it was a little bit short because the scratch cards were sold on the retail side, which the retail side's opening hours were a lot longer. 
than the post office. So that would never balance um, up until a Wednesday when we'd have to roll over, where we'd stop selling the scratch cards at a certain point to, to check and balance. But that was, the, I was told just to make, it was, I think it was about a hundred and something pounds to make it good immediately, which I did. Um, and that was fine, that was, carry on. Um, the next time your branch was audited was on the 10th of October, 2017, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Um, who attended your branch on that occasion? There was two auditors, uh, one named uh, Anjum Zuberi and Bupendra Shah. What were you asked to do on their arrival? Uh, on arrival, they put up a poster uh, to say the branch will be closed um, till the afternoon. Uh, I was asked to then log into the Horizon system for them to create their own logins, or add themselves into, into the system, um, and then to show them where everything was. What were you told when the audit had concluded? I was £57,500 short in cash. Um, and to which, to what did that relate? You've mentioned cash. Was that in relation to the ATM machine, to your knowledge, or just simply it was a shortage in the cash? At, the, at that point, they only just said it was just a shortage in the cash. Um, and then it was just, just after they said it was the ATM machine uh, is, is where the shortage has come from. Um, how did you react when you were told about this alleged shortfall? At first, I, at first I thought he was actually joking, um, but he said, no, I'm being serious, that there's a £57,500 shortage, um, at which point my heart literally hit the floor. And when did you last balance your accounts on Horizon before the audit took place? On the 4th of October. And what had been the result of your balance the previous week? It was fine, as far as I was aware. Had you been able to um, check the ATM machine when you did that balance? On the 4th of October, I didn't know because the I had misplaced the ATM key, which was uh, underneath a, a, a bag of coins in the main safe. Uh, so I rolled over with the existing figures on horizon. Um, what action did the post office take when this alleged shortfall was discovered? Uh, Anjum Zuberi, who was the lead auditor, had called the um, contracts advisor, uh, Anita Bravata, who then asked me, where's the money gone? What's happened to the money? Have I got any knowledge of it? Which I, which I didn't. Um, who then suspended me uh, immediately pending further investigation. What effect did your suspension have on your salary? It was completely stopped. What did you do when you were informed um, by Ms. Bravata that you were being suspended? Sorry, you said? What, what did you do when you were informed that you were going to be suspended? Um, at that point, I had to hand over, uh, empty out all, my, all the post office drawers, um, hand over the safe keys to uh, the auditors, who then put everything, all the cash and the stock, into the main safe at the back, locked it up, uh, put sticker seals uh, around the safe. They tried to change the code on the safe and the alarm keypad, uh, which they didn't know how to do, so they just left it as it was. Um, and they left at about four o'clock. You explained that the suspension resulted in your branch being closed by the post office. Did you, any, did you take any steps to try and stop the branch being closed? At that point, I did. Uh, well, on, the, on the point of where uh, the auditor had said there was a £57,500 shortfall, I did offer a cheque for the full value on the spot to allow me to continue trading even though I didn't have the money in the bank, I knew I would have had to source the money, but it would have given me a couple of days to get the money in the bank. Um, but that was declined by the contracts advisor, um, and it says to protect me and to protect them that we close the branch. Did you discuss the possibility of a temporary sub-postmaster being appointed? Yes, I did. Um, 
I did say that it is coming up to the main period of the year, which is Christmas. Um, if we could get a temporary sub postmaster in just to keep the services going. Um, they did put an internal letter or memo or something out to the their, their own contractors. I had two, two contractors contact me, um, asking me the times of the branch opening hours um, and if there was an ATM machine or not. And when I told them the opening hours and there was an ATM machine installed, um, they literally hung up on me. What steps did you take to seek support from your union when your branch was closed? I was advised by the lead auditor to contact the National Federation of Sub-Postmasters, uh, which I did do. Um, I spoke to a guy called Keith Richards. Um, I went to go and see one of the representatives in Newcastle uh, shortly after. What advice did you receive from Mr Richards? Um, once I had spoken to Mr Richards and told him my full story, um, I was advised at the end of it to get a criminal solicitor. You've explained in your statement um, the post office contacted you the day after the audit and your suspension, is that correct? On the correct? 11th, yes. Um, who spoke to you on that occasion? Uh, I was called by Matt Mowbray, uh, Investigation Security Manager. What did he say? At that point he gave me two options. Uh, option one was to pay the money back immediately or I'd be looking at a two-year prison sentence. How did you feel when you were told that you could be prosecuted? by the post office for this short Very period. scared, very scared. What did you do when you were presented with these choices? Uh, I panicked. Um, I literally called as many people as I could from my phone book to get money together to pay the post office back. Um, my last and final phone call was to my father-in-law, uh, explained the whole situation, um, who then called up the following day on the 12th of October to repay the full amount uh, with debit card. Were you then permitted by the post office to return to work? No. Uh, at that point I was still suspended pending an investigation. Do you know why having paid the alleged shortfall you weren't allowed to be reinstated? Because they were doing an investigation to see what had, what, what had happened. Um, you were invited by the post office to attend a criminal interview, is that right? It was a criminal interview under caution, yes. When were you informed that you were to be interviewed? I can't remember the exact date, uh, but I think it was about a week or so later. Do you recall who notified you? It was Matt Mowbray. Um, what steps did you take to obtain representation at your interview? Uh, I did contact the uh, National Federation of Postmasters who said if I was going to challenge the post office on, on this sh alleged shortfall, uh, they would not be able to assist and to get a criminal solicitor, uh, which they wouldn't assist in or uh, get me a criminal solicitor under the Federation. I then contacted uh, the National Retail Federation, who appointed me a, solicitor, a criminal solicitor. Um, your interview took place on the 26th of October of 2017, is that That's right? Correct, yes. Who conducted the interview? It was Matt Mowbray and Mr Watson. Um, was your lawyer present during the interview? Yes, my lawyer, uh, Michelle George from Blackfords. Well, I think you've mentioned you were cautioned. Is that, was it an interview under caution? So I received uh, an email from Matt Mowbray saying that he was going to be um, under police caution. Police were going to be present. Um, when I turned up on the day, there was no police. It was at um, uh, a directly managed branch, uh, Barnet, in London. Um, it was only Matt Mowbray, Mr Watson, myself and my solicitor that were present. Um, but Matt Mowbray had uh, put me under caution for the interview. Um, how did you feel during the interview? At first I was very anxious, very scared. 
um, of what, what the outcome would be because I thought the police were going to be there, but the, there was no police or anything. Uh, but my solicitor, Michelle, that was with me, uh, put me at ease um, and just just comforted me in, in every step uh, of the interview. Um, yeah, I was, I was fine after that. What did you tell the post office investigators? Uh, they kept asking me, where's the money gone? Um, what have you done with it? So I haven't taken anything. Um, I don't live a plush lifestyle. Um, where would I hide £57,500 in cash? I said, there could, there's, def, there's got to be a, some problem in the horizon system. Um, to which his reply was, everyone says that. When were you notified of the outcome of the post office's criminal investigation? I think it was on the 20th of December, um, 2017. Um, I was told initially that it was going to be uh, seven to 14 days from the date of the interview, um, but it took longer because apparently the post office uh, investigation team only meet once a month to review cases. And what were you told would happen next? Um, at the end of the interview, I was actually supposed to be provided with um, a copy of the recording, the cautioned interview. Um, unfortunately, the recording device had actually malfunctioned, so no recording was available. Um, on numerous occasions, I then challenged the post office and asked them for a transcript of the interview, which I was denied saying that it was commercially privileged documentation. Were you charged at the conclusion of the criminal investigation? No. There was no further action. You attended a meeting on the 15th of November 2017, is that right? That's correct, yes. Um, who conducted that meeting? It was uh, uh, Paul Southern, uh and that was conducted at post office head office. Uh, Finsbury Dials, um, and that was for a informal meeting to discuss the shortfall. I think you've mentioned um, he was a contracts advisor for the post office, is that correct? Correct, yes. Um, what did you tell him about the shortfall? I had no knowledge of any, any shortfall. Um, I had no knowledge of any shortfall in the office whatsoever. Um, I had looked at, I, I had, once I discovered that there was this shortfall, once the auditors had discovered there was a shortfall, um, I had to then investigate my staff as well to see if they had put their hands in the till because I was still, I was being told by the, po by, by the post office uh, contracts advisor that the money has gone missing, uh, somebody has taken that money. I was also being told the same thing by the National Federation of Sub Postmasters that somebody has taken that money. So I investigated all my staff, um, looked at all their bank accounts, looked at their lifestyle, but there was nothing there, nothing had changed. Did you take any records or other documents with you to your meeting on the 15th um, of November? I did actually take a pre-prepared um, statement uh, with me uh, for the contracts advisor outlining that I had no idea of any shortfall in the office, that this is, there's got to be some sort of error within the computer system, Horizon. It may have been that I've entered a figure wrong because it was, it tallied up to be a, a week's worth of money for the ATM machine. During the, uh, during the um, refurbishment in 2015, while we were closed for the two weeks, the ATM was still operational. Um, as a process of investigation, I looked back at the figures to see, did I enter all the correct figures into Horizon at that time? I contacted the post office helpline um, 
to confirm this, but unfortunately they didn't. They don't hold the data, um, and nor does Bank of Ireland. What were you asked to do at the conclusion of your um, meeting with the contracts advisor on the 15th of November? I was asked to provide every printout of the ATM machine and the Horizon uh, system for the ATM stock unit from August 2015 to date. What steps did you take to gather the necessary information? Um, I had got my assistance from my brother-in-law to come in to literally sit there with me day and night to not only photocopy every single bit of paper but to put together um, an Excel spreadsheet to track the ins and the outs of the ATM machine. Um, the spreadsheet that you've just mentioned, is that the document um, that's exhibited is Exhibit 1 to your statement? That's correct, yes. You had um, a further meeting with Mr Sutton on the 5th of December of 2017, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Um, where did that meeting take place? It was a garden centre in Norwich uh, on the on the fifth. Um, I presented him with the information which I had found um, as a part of the investigation, rather than the post office trying to investigate anything. It was me trying to investigate what had happened, but I can only investigate what had happened from the documents which I had uh, available to me post office have access to everything from A to Z in the back office of the system. I don't, I was completely locked out. I wasn't allowed to use the system. I wasn't allowed to log into the system. My username was um, uh, deleted from the system. Um, so I was left to my own resources to try and establish what had happened. So upon creating this Excel spreadsheet to track the withdrawals value, the inputted value, um, I discovered that potentially there could be a £53,000 shortfall from the ATM machine, but not a, it's not a, a physical cash shortfall, it's a miscalculation of figures from the ATM machine. What did you tell Mr Sutton about your findings in the meeting of the 5th of December? Uh, I had presented him with the, with the Excel spreadsheet. Um, and all the he had all the copies of of the slips from the ATM machine as well, um, to which I never got anything back from. How did your meeting with him on the fifth um, conclude? Um, I just have to wait until they get uh, until he gets back to me. Were you surprised that you were being asked to investigate and explain the cause of the shortfall? Yes, because I didn't have the information that they have. So they can track all the deliveries, all the ins, the outs, everything from their end, but I can only see what is in black and white in front of me. What support did you receive from your customers and your community during the period of your suspension? Immediately after my suspension, um, there was two individuals, um, Eleanor Sheikh and Alan, I can't remember his surname, um, who Alan created a online petition. Eleanor had physically actually gone out and done a manual petition. Um, in total, I think we received approximately 3,000 signatures. Uh, one of the customers, her name was Mrs. Perkins, remember very well. Um, she said that she would put, put her life on the line for my, for my um, honesty, um, which was very heartwarming. You were notified on the 5th of February of 2018 that your contract had been terminated, is that right? That's correct, yes. Um, how was this decision communicated to you? I'd received a special delivery letter um, in the post, just this three-page letter, 
to say that I had alleged breaches in my contract um, and my contract was being terminated uh, with immediate effect and they'd be in contact with me what the next step would be. Um, that letter is your Exhibit 3, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Um, how did you feel when you were informed of the post office's decision? Heartbroken. Heartbroken to the degree that I didn't know what to do, didn't know which way to turn, who to speak to, what, what the next process was. Um, I tried to contact Paul, uh, Paul to appeal the decision that he had made, um, but I was told that, there's, that I have no right to an appeal under the new contract. What action did you take to escalate your case within the post office? I contacted uh, Paula Venos, um, explaining the entire situation, the entire process. Um, she, she got back to me quite, quite sif swiftly um, and said that I don't have a right to an appeal, uh, but she will she will ask um, Alistair Cameron, Chief Audit, uh, Auditor, or Accounts Manager, Director, um, to just go over the, the case, um, which he did do. And a week later, I received uh, an email from Flag Case Advisor um, outlining everything that Paul had already written, uh, which was, I couldn't explain the £57,500 shortfall. I don't know how I could explain it if I didn't know it was there. Um, putting me back in would be a risk to post office funds. Um, and brand damage, putting me back in would be brand damage because what if it happens again? Um, you've explained in your statement that the uh, post office raised um, two further issues. One related to alleged your alleged failure to make cash declarations. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Um, and the second one was um, that you'd allegedly not returned money when requested. Had these matters ever been brought to your attention before this Never. Before your, the termination of your contract? Never. So I later learned that the post office horizon system has a cutoff point at 7 p.m. You've got to declare your cash holdings by 7 p.m. If I was to do that, I'd be posing a risk to myself because my branch didn't close till 7 p.m. So I was still serving customers up until that point. So if I was to take all my cash and stock out of the back safe and the biddy safe held underneath the counter and put it on top of the counter, if someone came in and robbed the place, I'd be held liable for that. Not only would I be held liable for the cash and the stock, but my life would be on the line. So I couldn't complete their request by 7 p.m. But I only later learned that after the contract had been terminated. So from August 2015 up until October 2017, I was doing cash declarations after 7 p.m. And it was never brought to my attention during that time that I was doing anything wrong. Um, I used to send back money on a weekly basis there was, I think, one or two weeks that I didn't send back any money because I didn't have the uh, bags to send the money back in, which were on order. So as soon as I did receive the bag, all the money was sent back. As far as you were concerned, y you had been balancing and returning correctly, is that right? That's correct, yes. What... Um, steps did you take to notify your local MP of your situation? I was in contact with um, our local mayor, which was Penny Rivers, 
and our husband, who is a counsellor, uh, Paul Rivers. Um, both of them, myself and Eleanor, had contacted Jeremy Hunt, uh, who we had set up a meeting with, to ask Jeremy Hunt to intervene within this situation, to ask for a review or to assist in what, what can we do. Um, Jeremy then, at the end, Jeremy then contacted Paula Venels via, via phone um, and she agreed to get an independent review of my case. Who was appointed to conduct the independent review? Angela Vanden Bogard. When did the review take place? I can't remember the date. <laughs> Just check to see. I don't think we've given it an episode. I think it was a rough statement. May have been around about March, March, April uh, of 2018. Of 18, yeah. What steps did you take to arrange representation at your review meeting? <coughs> um, I had then contacted um, other sub-postmasters in the local area. I was then put in touch with um, a guy called Nilesh Joshi, who's um, the National Federation of Sub-Postmasters Representative, who agreed to come along to the to the review with Angela Vanden Bogard. During that point, I had applied for the decision rationale from the post office, um, so, so all the documentation which the post office held on me, so I could see what was on the on the file that um, Paul Paul had written, the original contracts advisor had written about my case. What did you discover on reviewing that file? Uh, they had already made their mind up that they were going to terminate my contract uh, from day one. One of the, on, on one of the document, on the one of the call logs, uh, Anjum, who is the lead auditor, had called up the following day, so on the 11th, and informed the call centre that the post office was this post office was going to be closed for the foreseeable future. Also, Paul Southern had written a report based on lies um, that I had allegedly owed my father-in-law the fifty-seven and a half thousand pounds that he had paid, which was not true. Um, because he was a director to the business as well, so he had put that money in. And that was the first time that I had seen various notes that he had written. Unfortunately, I can't remember them off the top of my head. What action did you take to draw these matters to the attention of your NFSP representative? Uh, so I, I showed the NFSP representative the documentation uh, he had quite clearly said the horizon system isn't wrong, doesn't get it wrong. Um, two plus two equals four as, as far as the horizon system is concerned. I actually went to his post office in East London somewhere um, for him to demonstrate the way that he had set up his office, which was completely different to the way that my office was set up. Um, and he had no idea of the way individual stock units work as opposed to a shared stock unit. What's the difference between an individual stock unit and a shared stock unit? Individual stock unit is like having separate tills. So, for, for example, when you go into Sainsbury's, uh, you've got multiple tills, but they're all independent to each other, whereas a shared stock unit is a combined uh, combined till. So even though you've got two separate terminals, the 
figures in the back end, the cash, the stock is combined between the two tills. So when you do a cash declaration, they com you're putting in individual figures, but they combine the two figures together. Um, can you please describe your meeting with Ms. Van den Bogert? Um, she had said to me to go in with an open mind, which I did. Um, and again, went through everything um, in terms of £57,500. I have no idea where it's gone. I had provided uh, Paul with various documents which I had got, which was the Excel spreadsheet. Um, as part of the investigation, the um, possibility that figures weren't entered correctly uh, during 2015 when the refurbishment happened, um, but all this was disregarded. Um, and then Angela drew up to her own conclusion that the decision which Paul had made was the correct decision. How was her decision communicated to you? It was via letter. You had a telephone conversation with her after you were informed of the decision, is that right? Yes, yeah, so immediately after I received the letter, um, I'd called her back up again. Um, I said, I'm still not happy with the outcome because you still haven't provided me with any evidence of where this money has gone. And her words were that the money doesn't have legs, it can't run away. So where has the money gone? What advice did she give you during your conversation? At the end of that, near towards the end of that phone call, she said, you need to stop dwelling on the past and think about the future. She goes, you could get a family member to apply to be a sub-postmaster at the branch. What steps did you take to secure the reopening of your branch? I contacted my brother-in-law who was working at another branch at the time, um, who agreed to relocate himself and his family in Farncombe so he could come and uh, reopen the branch as a temporary postmaster to then become permanent. What changes did you make to the branch before you reopened it? I had to secure, give, give the post office a secure area in the back where the main safe was. I had to then divide the retail counter to the post office counter by putting a secure door in between um, on a te as a temporary measure. But this was done all at my own cost. A post office auditor attended your branch on the 18th of June of 2018, is that That's right? correct, yes. And what was the purpose of his visit? Uh, it was to reopen the branch, um, but no one knew about it except them. He conducted a transfer ordered at the branch later that day, is that right? So on the 18th when he came in um, and he said he was there to reopen the branch, um, I told him that there was, there was nobody here. Uh, the, the temporary sort of postmaster that's coming in, he's working at another branch. He then went away, uh, came back about an hour or so later and said that he's been told by his manager to conduct a transfer audit from me to them, even though my contract had been terminated and I would no longer anything to do with, with any of it. Um, I allowed him to come into the back area and open up the safe as he checked all the seals and um, I, I de, de undone the alarm, uh, put the alarm code in to, to deactivate the alarm. Um, and then he had gone back to the horizon system, inputted the figures um, that he had on, no, he inputted the figures by counting all the cash and stock. So when, sorry, take a step back. When he logged onto the Horizon system um, and pressed the cash declaration button on, this, on the Horizon system, it was showing everything as zero, zero. Whereas it should have shown the figures that were last entered he then counted all the cash and stock, re-entered the figures into Horizon, and there was a further shortfall 
of just over £5,000. Um, just going back to when he first commenced the transfer audit, you mentioned that he checked the seals on the safe. Was yeah. he satisfied that the safe hadn't been opened yes. since your branch was closed? Yes, nothing had been tampered with. Um, none of the seals were broken. He had a, a, a picture of the, the safe that the original auditor had taken and put on file. But when he did a check of all the cash and stock held in the branch, Horizon showed a, what would be effect a further shortfall of five thousand and just over five thousand pounds. Yes. How did the auditor react when he discovered this apparent shortfall? He was quite shocked himself at first. He then contacted, um, he called the original auditor and said that this is what he's discovered. The original auditor then, he was on loudspeaker on the phone, then said to me that I'm liable for that shortfall, uh, that I've got to put the money in for that f just over £5,000, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I said I'm not putting the money in, I'm not paying a single penny. You reported this shortfall to Miss Van der Bogert, is that correct? So, I, yeah, I called her up immediately. I said, this is what the auditor has, has found. Um, she then spoke to the auditor and said, uh, to confirm that the, the seals on the safe were everything was all fine, um, everything was still intact, which, which he confirmed everything was intact. Um, she had then said to me, leave it with her, don't worry about it. She had then contacted uh, InSafe, who's the company that, that takes care of all the safes. We've got, a, there was a digital uh, lock system it, uh, installed on the safe in 2015, which a, a, somebody had come out from InSafe to actually audit the safe to confirm that nothing had that that safe wasn't tampered with or opened because it was all digitalized it tells them that if the door had been opened or anything had been tampered with which everything was clear um, there was no activity on the safe whatsoever do you recall the date on which your branch was reopened 22nd of june 2018 who attended to reopen the branch on that day uh, it was the same auditor that attended on the 18th, uh, Janae Tanvir. What advice did he give you about the recent update that you made to the ATM? Um, he, at that point, he, when he had come in, um, he had actually loaded the ATM up on the 18th of June uh, when he came in to allow the community to, to use the ATM machine. So when he came in on the on the twenty second, um, a balance was done on the twenty second with uh, my brother in law, who was a temporary sub postmaster, coming in, um, and he also he had also mentioned, watch out for the figures on the ATM machine, as when the Bank of Ireland do a remote update, it throws the figures out on the ATM machine. What happened when you balanced your accounts on the 27th of June? The figures didn't match. There was a difference between the withdrawals value and the dispense since load figures, which should be the same. What action did the post office take um, in relation to the alleged shortfall of £5,050 that was discovered? during the transfer audit of the 18th of June? Uh, once Angela had said to me, don't worry about it, uh, my brother-in-law came in, he took over. Uh, shortly after, he'd received an invoice from the post office asking for £5,050 uh, for that shortfall. How, he wasn't even there. He was, at, he was working at a different branch. How could they send him an invoice for something that he wasn't present for what he had no idea about. How did you resolve that shortfall? <laughs> My brother-in-law firstly called up the helpline um, 
saying that I've got no knowledge about this. Um, I then, while I was contacting Ang Angela van den Bogard, um, it was literally just cleared, just wiped away. I have since been pursuing it with my brother-in-law of where did this £5,000 shortfall come from? Um, there's no answer to it. What effect did your suspension have on your business? It was the busiest time of the year. Um, we lost out on the entire Christmas trade. I had to send, because we've got a lot of elderly in our community who can't get to another branch, I had to spend uh, in excess of £6,000 on my credit card to go to another branch to buy stamps to sell to the local community to make a non is non profit because it was sold at the same price. For how long was your branch closed? Approximately eight and a half to nine months. What effect did this have on your finances? I had a very good retail trade, but because I didn't have the foot flow coming through. Um, it did have a, a, a small impact on, on my retail trade as well, but I lost my income. My income was the post office income. I was serving just under 1,500 customers a week on a two-counter local post office. What consequence did the termination of your contract have upon your business? I had to find money to pay the bills because I was I was in a deficit of four and a half thousand pounds a month. Um, people weren't coming in because they knew that the post office was closed. So the products weren't selling in, in the shop. What do you now do for a living? I still currently work behind the post office counter. What's your role? Manager of the same branch. What impact did the post office audit and investigation have on your mental health? Uh, I've had to pull away from everyone. Um, I turned to alcohol to give me comfort. Um, my marriage has broken down. Uh, I stay away from home as much as I can. I just want to be left like on my own. How is your confidence in yourself affected? It made me feel stupid, worthless, incompetent. Um, I was, I regarded myself as a, I'm, I'm an educated person, I have a degree, I went to school, um, I was very ac academic, but it just made me feel I was worthless. How is your relationship with your children affected? It affected my eldest child quite a lot because there was rumours going around. She used to come home and say, Daddy, are you going to jail? So what, what response can I give to that? I said, no, I'm not, I'm gonna be here. Have you sought to recover the sum of 50, 57, 000, um, 57 and a half thousand pounds from the post office? Uh, I've had no choice but to join this historical shortfall scheme. Um, prior to joining the historical for shortfall scheme, I did contact um, Paula Venels again, um, saying that I wasn't happy with the outcome of Angela's investigation or review. She then appointed a lady called Julie Thomas to do a further review of my case. 
as she had gone through the first part of that review, uh, the historical shortfall scheme came up, which she then said that it would be unfair for her to conduct a review of my case and to join the historical shortfall scheme. Um, at first, I didn't join the scheme and the closing date did close, at which point I did uh, a, put in a application for judicial review for the historical shortfall scheme, being led by... I can't remember the solicitor's name, firm name now. Herbert Smith Freehills, um, who were also involved in the HBOS sc uh, scam uh, and the Lloyds Bank uh, compensation scheme. Not only that, but once you join the historical shortfall scheme and the post office give you an offer, whether it be a pound or whether it be a million pounds, you are bound in that scheme. You lose your civil rights. I don't see why I should be able, why I should lose my civil rights. But I've been forced to now join that scheme, um, and I'm waiting. So your application has been accepted, has it? As a late applicant, yes. As a late applicant, it's been acknowledged, but you haven't had a substantive response to it yet. I haven't had any response. How do you now feel about the way that you were treated by the sub by the post office during your time as a sub postmaster? For something which I've given everything to, um, it still makes me feel worthless on on what I do. Even though the branch, um, as, even though I'm not the sub postmaster there, I still have pride and passion for what I do not only for the business, but for the local community. Um, to me, there's no amount of money that can compensate for it. It's my good faith, it's my good name, it's my standing within the community that matters to me the most. What do you think needs to be done to achieve justice for sub-postmasters who've been affected by the failings of Horizon and the actions of the post office? People need to be held to account for what they've done to not only me, but all the others as well. Um, in my case, it was months before the group litigation had just launched, uh, was due to start. They knew that there was a problem in the system. They had the opportunity to uh, correct the errors but they decided to they decided to not correct the errors because of the group litigation in my view that if they had if angela had reversed the decision then it would have had a huge impact going forward on many other cases I have no further questions for you, Mr. Sipura. Is there anything you would like to say? Uh, I have prepared a little summary, if I could. Uh, post office brought misery not only to me, but my family and also a local community. I had goals and plans to give myself and my family a better life and a brighter future. This was stolen away from me overnight. Post office from the top to bottom knew there were bugs, errors and defects within the computer system, especially when it came to an ATM machine. Post office tried to take away documents which I held in branch but were unsuccessful as I stood my ground and told them that it's information which I have produced, not them, so I would not be handing anything over. I was advised by the auditor to make a to t have a look at my trading statements, which I had produced from Horizon to try and identify the alleged shortfall. I had gone through all this over and over again, but could not find anything wrong. I had followed everything the way in which I had been trained, not for days, weeks or months, but for years. 
As informed by post office investigator, the alleged, the alleged shortfall has come about in the last six months of the date of the audit. If that was the case, then why would post office continue to send large amounts of money week in, week out to service the office? Why was this not brought to my attention earlier via phone call, email, letter in the post to say that something may be wrong that we could have investigated at that time? But as far as I was aware, everything was okay. I was left fearing that I may have to leave my family and friends behind for a while because I may be sent to prison or arrested. I cannot even describe the way I felt as I have always been a law-abiding citizen with a clean record. Advised by the Sub-Postmaster Federation to obtain a criminal solicitor due to the value of the alleged loss, threatened by the post office investigators that I'd be interviewed with the police present under caution, to me, this is all bully tactics to try and get someone to say they have done something, even though they haven't. I was shadowed by a fantastic solicitor, Michelle George, who gave me all the confidence to stand my ground. Approximately over £80,000 worth of cash and stock was left in my premises for near nine months. Even though Post Office Limited terminated my contract, I was told I had no right to appeal this, which I thought was totally bizarre, as if I had murdered someone and admitted I committed the crime. The police would still have to build a case to take to the CPS, then to court, if I was found guilty of the crime, I would still have the right to an appeal. This is the law of the land. The law of the land also states that any person is innocent till proven guilty. But with the government-owned post office, I was guilty until I could prove my innocence, like many others. The contracts advisor, who has been there for many years, conducted little to no investigation to establish what actually happened. Instead, all I got from Paul, the contracts advisor, was a three-page letter outlining breaches to the contract, which I disagree with, as I was following the same process daily since January 2013. Also following the same process after reopening the branch once the refurbishments were completed. If the alleged breaches were not a problem for over those years, why has it become a problem all of a sudden? I had challenged the post office for many documents which should have been provided to me. Instead, I had to pay under the freedom of information and data access through information rights, to which I was generally told by Kerry Modi, information rights manager, this is commercially privileged. When I kept challenging this, I was told in a polite way by Kerry to go away as she will not respond to any more emails from me. I was contacting many other sub postmasters who helped me as much as they could to identify possible causes which led to me which led me to provide information to Paul Sutherland to investigate rather than being the other way around. I was left scared, anxious, depressed, stupid, worthless incompetent. I'm sure there are many more words that could describe my mental state and feelings. This was all done by the hands of one individual representing the most trusted band brand in our country, Post Office Limited. Angela van der Bogard was appointed to conduct an independent review of my case, but because the trend was already set by Paul Sutherland, she could not go back and change that, even if she wanted to, as this was months before the GLO was to start. I was left a broken man. I used to be confident, proud, outgoing, always made time for my family and friends. This has now all changed due to the way the post office have treated me. My marriage is broken due to the stress of me trying to prove not only to the post office, but also to my wife that I have not done anything wrong. Even to date, we argue because I was in charge, so I am to blame. The post office has turned me into a self-centered individual that all I seem to do now is to prove that I have not done anything wrong. 
and always just want to be left alone. Interaction with my children has been hard, as my oldest daughter used to ask me, Daddy, are you going to jail? This broke me even more. I could not even look my kids in the face. I would lock myself in my bedroom and not come out, sometimes leave the house when they were asleep and not return until they were asleep. I could not face anyone as fingers were being pointed. People had now a different view of me. I had many thoughts of suicide, running away, relocating, but I was extremely lucky to have my father-in-law, all my staff, all my friends who supported me through my darkest days. They gave me strength and support to get to where I am today. I have to give up something that I was so proud of and worked so hard for without any financial gain whatsoever. Post office have a lot to answer for in the way they conducted my case, as I still have not got answers. During the time where the post office was shut down, a further five, over £5,000 gone missing from the Horizon system. The post office put this down to auditor's mistake and was quickly and quietly brushed under the carpet. Why? because the very person dealing with the alleged, short, uh, the alleged second short, shortage could not go back and say, sorry, this could be a systemic error, as this whole class action would have collapsed. It would have definitely saved the UK government a substantial amount of money. At this point, I had no doubt there is definitely a problem with the computer system. All the evidence is there. If a shortfall can occur when the computer system has been shut down, not used, what can, what can the system do when it is in use, committing thousands of transactions a day? I am today still passionately serving my community behind the same post office that I was accused of taking or losing £57,500. With the help and support of the people I now... Of, with the help and support of the people around me, I have now become stronger to have the courage and support to battle the post office. I would not allow, allow a man-made computer system beat me. I am determined. I have been left a broken man mentally, but with the support I have behind, behind me makes me stronger than ever. I have had no choice but to join the HSS scheme, the historical shortfall scheme, as I do not have the bottomless pockets that the post office do, even though this, in my view, is abusing public money. I disagree with the HSS scheme because of the way that you're tied into the scheme. What I would ask the post office to do is the right and lawful thing, which would be pay back what I have paid, including the interest, put me back into the financial position that I would have been in Unfortunately, no amount of money is going to be able to buy time, a family, or love, or mental health. But what it can do is only help move on in life to do things which my family missed out on due to the post office's wrongs. All right, so thank you for the opportunity to, for me to say what I said. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, do you have any questions for this witness? No, no, thank you very much. Um, it's been very good to see you again, Mr. Sipura, um, and I'm very grateful to you for your participation in this inquiry, and in particular for your willingness to come uh, today to give evidence orally to me. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. That takes us to 20 to 1. Um, we have some witness summaries uh, that can be read, um, I believe, now, if that would be convenient. Um, yeah, that would be If I release Mr. Sipura from the witness box. Yeah, fine. Uh, with your permission, Sir Wynne. Yes, of course. Uh, sir, I will now read uh, summaries of the full and detailed witness statements uh, that you have before you. Mr Graham Ward uh, has an A-level in computer science and is also part qualified as an accounts technician. He has a good understanding uh, of computer systems. 
Mr Ward's father had worked for the General Post Office and Mr Ward says he thought of the Post Office as a large, trustworthy institution. Mr Ward thought the Post Office would be a family business uh, he could do until retirement and that his sons could one day take over. Mr Ward was the sub-postmaster of uh, Rivenhall Post Office from September 2002 to November 2008 and fearing post office from June 2005 uh, to uh, November 2008 also. Mr Ward says the Horizon training was incorporated into four weeks of on-site training which started on the day he took over the branch. Mr Ward says he found the post office helpline advice frustrating and uh, they were unable to provide practical help. The helpline advice would double his shortfalls and Mr Ward would undo the shortfall by doing the opposite of what the helpline told him to do. Mr Ward paid the post office um, had money deducted from his wages to pay alleged shortfalls. Mr Ward received a letter from the post office threatening legal uh, action and prosecution if he did not pay shortfalls. Mr Ward was audited and suspended by the post office for alleged shortfalls. Mr Ward's contract was subsequently terminated. Mr Ward says he is still suffering stigma and reputational damage. He has been labelled a thief. The post office trainers told the new owners of the post office that Mr Ward had stolen money from the post office. Mr Ward lost his family. His marriage of 13 years broke down and he feels guilty that he could not provide for his sons. Mm. Mr Ward ended up with an IVA uh, for six years. Mr Ward was embarrassed. He is no longer confident and does not feel worthy and good enough. It may come as a surprise that despite all that he has suffered, Mr Ward says, I would like to think that Post Office Limited were just doing their job and what, they told were told and what they were told. I would like to think that they did not maliciously target me. I would like to think that the, the shortfalls were accidental and the Post Office didn't know how to get, get out, so it let it run. Mr Ward says, I don't want Post Office Limited employees going to jail and ruining their families as that would not be fair on their kids. I don't want another family to go through what my family has gone through. Sir Isabella Armstrong Wall uh, was the sub postmistress of the Bonus Road Post Office in Barrow and Furness from August 1995 until September 2011. Isabella worked as an operator on the telephone exchange for 20 years from the age of 17, uh, working her way up to supervisor. She was able to become a sub postmistress as there was a close relationship between the two companies. She was looking for a change of pace and thought that running a small post office was ideal. Isabella paid £75,000 for the business and £5,000 for stock taking out a mortgage on the family home and a business loan. She also spent a further £75,000 refurbishing the branch, which also contained a convenience store. She employed seven part-time staff. Isabella received uh, two days of in-branch training on the Horizon system. The post office trainer spent most of the time on his mobile phone, which Isabella says the training was inadequate she began experiencing shortfalls, uh, which she would use her own money to make good. In 2009, there was a huge shortfall of £37,000. Isabella was suspended by the post office, but later reinstated after she remortgaged her house to pay this. The post office made no attempt to find the cause of the shortfall, despite Isabella repeatedly asking for help. The insinuation was that she had stolen the money. Some months later, another shortfall of £11,000 arose on the Horizon system. Isabella called the helpline again, asking for help. She followed their instructions 
and the amount more than doubled to £24,000. She was audited again and suspended. She insisted there was a fault in the Horizon system, but was repeatedly told it was fault-proof. Her contract was terminated and she entered into an IVA, IVA to settle her debts. Isabella was paid uh, £2,000 a month by the temporary sub-postmaster the post office installed, which did not cover all the bills she was liable for. Isabella was declared bankrupt in 2017. Her shop was repossessed and all her investments lost. She sank into depression, as did her husband, and still struggles with her mental health. Isabella has sought counselling for depression and anxiety, Isabel feels, Isabella feels she has been treated like a criminal and received abuse from some in the community. Isabella says, The post office caused me financial ruin, but also severely damaged my mental health and caused great distress, distress by treating me like a criminal and making false accusations. My husband and I had plans for our retirement, but they were all, they were all ruined. It broke my heart to have the post office taken away from me when I had loved working at the heart of the community so much. Sir, Mr Shane Johnson was the sub-postmaster of the Victoria Road Post Office in Kirby in Ashfield from October 2003 until September 2014. Mr Johnson was a single parent uh, who believed the role of sub-postmaster would provide flexibility to work and parent at the same time. Mr Johnson attended a five-day training course uh, which covered basic transactions on the Horizon system. Shane then received further in-branch training for six days. In 2007, Shane was advised by the post office that they were introducing cash machines into his branch. He received 10 minutes of training on this by an engineer. Mr Johnson called the helpline approximately five times a week following the introduction of the cash machine as he began experiencing shortfalls following its introduction. He states that the helpline advisors had no knowledge of how cash machines ran. Mr Johnson estimates that he paid over £50,000 in shortfalls to the post office an audit was conducted on the 30th of August 2007, where a shortfall of £25,000 was alleged. Mr Johnson was not suspended at the time. On the advice of the National Federation of Sub-Postmasters, he agreed to split the shortfall with the post office. Mr Johnson paid half of the money. The post office agreed to write off the rest of the sum. By spring 2014, Mr Johnson was on the verge of bankruptcy because the post office advised him that he was liable to pay the shortfalls or risk facing criminal prosecutions. prosecution. As a result, Mr Johnson felt compelled to resign and he sold his business at a loss. Mr Johnson blames the post office for putting him in a no-win situation. Shane had to pay the shortfalls but was on the verge of bankruptcy as a result of doing so. His family life declined. Uh, he was spending so much time at work worrying about the shortfalls. He became paranoid and anxious, began suffering uh, with depression and lost all his confidence. Mr Johnson believes he would still be running a successful business had it not been for the flawed Horizon system. Mr Johnson says... I would like the full truth to come out. I want the world to know that I and other ordinary, hard-working, decent people have had their lives ruined by the post office. I am entitled to be properly compensated for the losses I have suffered as a result of the post office. I would like this to be sooner rather than later. Sir was the sub-postmaster of the Markfield Post Office in Leicester from November 2006 to April 2008. He had a background in the financial services and felt confident he could build up a successful business with the post office. 
received two days of training on the Horizon system, describes the training as inadequate, found the system clunky from the start, and shortfalls appeared from day one. Sought help via the post office helpline, but found the advice generic and unhelpful. Was told by the post office that the problems he was experiencing were a result of human error. Paid more than twelve and a half thousand pounds in shortfalls to the post office. Decided to sell the business as it was running at a loss. Any profit made from it was used to pay shortfalls. The contract was terminated following an audit. I was unable to sell the business and was financially ruined as he had no income coming in. I had no other choice but to sell his personal belongings to pay bills and to cover shortfalls. He blames the post office for decline in his social standing relationships, physical and mental health. He suffered stress and anxiety as, although he was not charged with a criminal offence, the threat of it loomed over him. He was ostracised by his family and is on, only now able to build a relationship again with them. He says, what happened to me and hundreds of other decent people is an absolute outrage. It is a disgrace that it is impossible to put into words. I hope to receive some closure, some vindication, an apology for what I have been through and what I have lost. I want the post office to be held to account publicly. Sir, Mrs Donna Gosney, uh, her husband served in the military for 23 years. Following his retirement, they decided to buy a post office to spend more time together. Mrs. Gosney thought the post office would be a safe and secure job and that they could run until retirement. Mrs. Gosney received two days of training on the Horizon system. Mrs. Gosney contacted the post office helpline at least 132 times between November 2001 and April 2007, usually in regards to shortfalls. Sometimes, when Mrs. Gosney followed the helpline advice, the shortfall would multiply. The helpline told her that she was the only one with this issue. When Mrs. Gosney took over from the previous sub-postmistress, a system was in place where they would balance and check stamps by lunchtime, and then check the lottery, and roll the accounts over at the end of the day. The post office trader expressly told Mrs. Gosney that she should continue uh, with this process for balancing and said, if it's not broke, don't fix it. This system was how Mrs. Gosney's assistant, uh, whom the previous sub postmaster's mistress had recommended to Donna, stole £189,000 from the post office. Post Office Limited pursued Mrs. Gosney to recover the £189,000, despite knowing that Mrs. Gosney was not responsible for these monies. This is because the post office were fully aware that Mrs. Gosney's assistant had accepted responsibility for the theft and was convicted of the theft in relation to this money. Donna says, What astonishes me is why the post office horizon system did not pick up this massive loss of money, but that it only came to light in an audit. And the post office pursued me for the money regardless of the fact that my assistant accepted responsibility of this theft and was convicted of theft of this money. Despite this, and despite the fact that it was accepted by the post office that I had no hand in this theft, the post office sought to recover the money from me. Astonishingly, the post office obtained judgment against Mrs. Gosney in relation to these monies. Mrs. Gosney was interviewed under caution prior to her assistant being arrested and charged with theft. Donna describes this as the worst day of her life. Mrs. Gosney suffered reputational and financial damage in 2011. She was declared bankrupt. Donna moved away 
from the village to live with her daughter as she could not cope. Mrs Gosney is still on medication for anxiety. Mrs Gosney had depression and contemplated suicide. Mrs Gosney had to have a stressful and undignified conversation with her father when he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. She had to ask him to rewrite his will and leave her inheritance to her husband so that Post Office Limited could not claim it. Mrs Gosney's father died not knowing if she, if she was going to be all right, which Mrs Gosney finds unforgivable. Mrs Gosney wants the inquiry to recommend redress for the 555 sub-postmasters who were part of the group litigation. She wants the inquiry to hold those at the post office to account, to account for what they have done. Mrs Gosney would like Paula Venels to be stripped uh, of her titles and awards. Mrs Gosney does not want the post office to exploit others like they have her. Mrs Gosney would like a printed apology in the newspaper where she used to live in Shipton to put her reputation right. Mr Enright, I think we've reached one o'clock. So is that a convenient moment for you to take a break? Happy to, sir. There are only three left. We could uh, complete before lunch. OK, if you are happy to, let's do that. Yeah, fine. Thank you, sir. Sir, Mr Baljeet Singh Sandhu was the sub-postmaster of West Bolden Post Office between 2015 and 16. He ran the business with his wife. Mrs Sandhu and uh, his wife received two days of training on the Horizon system before taking over the business. They found the training to be basic and inadequate. Mr Sandhu began experiencing shortfalls very early on and would ring the helpline to inform them and ask for help. The post office advisers told him that he was responsible for the shortfalls and would have to make up the difference. Mr Sandhu had shortfalls almost every day and used the profits from his, the retail side of his business to pay the shortfalls. In 2016, the branch was audited and a shortfall of over £5,000 was discovered. Mr Sandhu refused to pay without being shown how the shortfall had occurred. He was immediately suspended and subsequently terminated by way of letter from post office. The post office began pursuing Mr Sandhu for the shortfall and threatened legal action. He tried to keep the retail business going, but without footfall from the post office, the business declined. Mr Sandhu could not meet the rent and bills, and his debts rose to approximately £100,000. Mr Sandhu was forced to sell the business at a loss and applied for an IVA. In addition to the financial burden, the emotional effect on Mr Sandhu and his wife has been, his family has been immense. He states, the situation put an enormous amount of psychological pressure on me and caused a great deal of stress. The process was very traumatic and I still suffer from health problems arising from it. A great stress was placed on my family and my relationships with my wife became strained as our debts increased. I have tremendous worry that I have been unable to give my children the opportunities I wanted. I did everything I could to alert the post office to the issues I was facing. I received no help from them. I would spend countless hours trying to work out why the shortfalls were occurring. I began doubting myself and my abilities. I became paranoid and would question everything. I do not think I will ever be the same person I was before these events. Through no fault of my own, I was treated like a thief and a criminal. Sir, Ms Denise Luttrell ran the Exford Post Office in Somerset from February 2007 until March 2015. Denise ran the branch with her partner, Gerald Shadbolt. Mr Shadbolt's supporting statement has been adduced in evidence, supporting the evidence of Ms Luttrell. Ms Luttrell was the sub-postmistress and Mr Shadbolt concentrated on the retail side of their business. Denise received uh, 10 days of training on the Horizon system, mostly on how to sell products. Denise had a further five days of in-branch training, which included assistance with her first balance. Denise says she still found balancing very difficult. She experienced small discrepancies every month, which she settled because she believed she had to under her contract. 
Ms Luttrell contacted the helpline regularly to report shortfalls but found the advice unreliable. Sometimes the reversing of a transaction would double the shortfall. Denise would usually pay the shortfalls if they were under £200. Ms Luttrell estimates that she paid in excess of £12,000 to the post office to cover shortfalls. Ms Luttrell was interviewed by the post office regarding the shortfalls in November 2010. The post office suggested that her partner, Mr Gerald Shadbold, was stealing money. Ms Luttrell found the stress found the stress too much to bear and in 2012 Mr Shadbolt run over, took over running the post office. He too became unwell due to the stress of having to run the post office single-handed as they could not afford staff. The shore force continued, they attempted to sell their business with no success. Ms Luttrell and Mr Shadbolt hold the post office totally responsible for their loss of investment and have incurred large debts which remain. They both still take antidepressants and both struggle with their mental health, something they attribute directly to the wrongful accusations made by the post office. Due to the stress, Denise was unable to spend time with her disabled autistic son. Ms Luttrell is now 70 years old and still having to work full time to pay the debts she and her husband have been left with. Ms Luttrell sums up the experience in this way. We lost all of our money and we lost our dreams. So finally, uh, Ms Dion Andre, who was the sub postmaster at a post office branch in South Shields from 2006. Two years later, in 2008, the post office offered Ms Andre a second post office uh, branch five minutes from her first. Ms Andre was delighted and accepted. Ms Andre received five days training at the main post office uh, at the main office in South Shields, followed by a one-day visit from a trainer in her branch. She did not receive further training, even when the new ATM machine was installed. In around 2008-2009, Dion started to notice shortfalls. She called the helpline almost daily. Dion says that calling the helpline was pointless. Ms Andre experienced a £31,000 discrepancy in the period of September 2009 to January 2010 and approximately 59000 in or around April 2010. Following an audit, Ms Andre was told that her business had accumulated a shortfall of £90,000. She was shocked and confused. The post office investigators told Ms Andre that if she repaid the money, it would reduce the risk of her being prosecuted. Dion was suspended. For six months, she heard nothing. She felt, says it felt like agony, not knowing what could happen to her and her business. Dion's contract manager advised her that her contract would be terminated if she did not resign. Following her resignation, the post office pursued um, Ms Andre for the £90,000 shortfall. Dion was forced to sell her business at a loss, max out her credit cards and borrow from her family. Ms Andre was emotionally and financially devastated. Her family suffered too. She considers that she has changed as a person forever and can never return to who she was. Ms Andre still finds it very painful to think about or talk, talk about her experiences, so much so that she was reluctant to become involved in this inquiry. It was only as a result of her mother's persuasion that she did so. Dion says, the more damaging indirect effect is that my family had to live through the entire experience with me. And for a long time, neither they nor I knew if I was going to be prosecuted or end up in prison for an offence I did not commit. To this day, my mother has followed every bit of this case, sometimes in an obsessive manner, and even when I said many years ago that I wanted to move on and forget about it all, she has never been able to forget and let go of it. My life has been totally derailed. The true impact cannot be put into words. Thank you, sir.
Thank you, Mr. Enright. And um, could I ask uh, whether I am correct in thinking that we now have three summaries left for clients of Hadjo's? Um, if someone could confirm that. Yes, sir. And are they happy to do that at 2.15, or is there any pressing reason why they would like to do it now? Miss Patrick says that they should be happy to do it at 2.15. Fine. Then we'll break off now and do it at 2.15. Thanks, everyone.